if they'd been educated by the law of Moses for that 1,000 year period that the Jews approached God through it, they would have known how many countless calves and lambs, pigeons and doves had been slaughtered. Innocent things, but they were being slaughtered because of their sins. But the rod of Hebrews would come along and say the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. But one would come as forecasted by Isaiah, Isaiah 53, who would be able to save us from our sins. And the writer of Hebrews made it clear that that was the Christ. So when you begin to view that six hours of misery, then it's something to think about our Lord saying, I'm going to become a man and do what they can't do. I'm going to go into a world I created and created perfect, but they ruin it by sin. They left me. They did me wrong. God never did them wrong. But there's a song that says, Oh, love that will not let me go. And that describes well the agape love Paul so well discussed in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And it's summed up in one verse known by all, but I doubt understood very well when John plainly wrote, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. There is an amazing thing about considering how God chose to save man. Now that makes it sound like he could have done another way, but there was no other way. Jesus in his prayer in Gethsemane alone, as the song says, said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. There was no other way. Was no other way. So in this sermon, we will emphasize the ninth hour, the hour that Jesus died. First of all, I want us to emphasize that it was an hour of endurance. Endurance. Endurance is a necessary part of Christianity. It's a part of living the Christian life. You'll see James saying something about that in James 5 and verse 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Then he helps us understand something about endurance and patience. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Today we tend to use the word patience in the way we use long suffering. You've got to just, you know, put up with it for a little while. Well, that is part of the meaning of endure. But you also understand something about the patience of Job when you read about Job and all that he went through. The idea is when you endure, you bear up under. No matter how much it hurts, it's sort of like sports, no pain, no gain. No matter how much it deprives you of a great many things you would love to do for yourself, for your family and others, but it's necessary for the kingdom's sake. It's not pleasant. It's not something that uh, feels good necessarily. And in the case of Christ, nailed to that cross. You must realize what he had even undergone before that. We won't talk about what it was to leave heaven and become a man and be in this sin-cursed world and be tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But when you come down to the garden and the struggles of my Lord as a man to undergo and to go through and to endure, what had already come upon him and was going to be worse. Then we see that in the spiritual body of Christ, while Paul said to Timothy, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You see why Christ is called the man of sorrows. And you see what all it put him through 
to save us. So we count them happy which endure. We count them happy that according to their lot in life they bear up under it. They fulfill what they're here for. They do not shirk their duty. They are determined at all costs to be well pleasing to their God. And the only way that one can, and that is from the heart to obey the truth under any and all circumstances. The prime example of endurance, then, is Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Jesus came to this moment having suffered insults. He was spat upon. All kinds of injuries inflicted upon him between the time of his arrest in the garden and to the actual crucifixion. He was blasphemed. He was mocked. He was railed upon shamefully entreated. He was tortured. Kept up all night long so he was weary. Crown of thorns crammed down on his head. And then of course he was whipped and whipped and whipped which many times caused the death of the one undergoing it. And Isaiah passage in 53 has a remark that with his stripes we are healed. Aren't you glad he endured? Aren't you thankful he endured? Can you see why Paul wrote so much about I glory in my infirmities? Or that I fill up the sufferings of Christ? Meaning that as members of the spiritual body of Christ, how am I able to be here except for the sufferings of Christ? And how can I be faithful except that I use Christ as the example for me to follow? And you know, he had done no sin. It's impossible for we who've been redeemed and purchased by Christ because we have sinned. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 6, 23. But we recognize that without him, then we're still in our sins. There's no hope for us without him. There's nothing but living life's little day and then the end comes, in which there's eternal damnation and torment forevermore because we die under the guilt of sin and the consequences of sin. Now the question is, why did Jesus put himself through this compounded misery of spirit, body, the excruciating pain inwardly and outwardly? Why? Why did he do that? Well, John 3.16 lets us know, but we need to think more about it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Well, the Father gave His Son, but the Son came. It was the assignment, if you please, of the second person of the Godhead, the executor of the Father's will, then to put into practice what needed to be done by deity to save us from our sins. So He became flesh. John says he dwelt among us. We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, favor, and truth. The 19th century preacher Spurgeon wrote of these things. In meditating on the motive that moved the Lord Jesus to come to your rescue, consider the august person who undertook your salvation and died for your sakes. He was God. He did not think it was robbery to be equal with God. He made the heavens. Without Him was not anything made that was made. The angels delighted to do Him homage. Every seraph's wing would fly at His bidding. All the host of heaven worshipped at his feet. All the powers of nature were under his control. He needed nothing to make him glorious. All things were his. And, his, and the power to make more than all. He might truly say, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and its fullness. Hemmed day and night by all the sacred choristers. He did not lack for praise. 
nor did he lack for servants. Legions of angels were always ready to do his command, listening to the voice of his word. It was this God, this ever-blessed one, who was from eternity with the Father and in whom the Father had infinite delight, who looked upon men with the eye of love, who was born in Bethlehem's manger, was the, inf was the infinite as well as the infant. And he who lived here, this life of present, toiling and suffering, was that same God who made the heavens and the earth, but who condescended to be incarnate for our sakes. Well might Isaiah, in his prophetic vision, proclaim the royal titles of the child who was to be born, and the son who, in the fullness of time, would be given to us and for us. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Let this truth sink into your souls, that it was God who came from heaven for your sakes. It was no inferior being, no one like yourselves, but it was very God of very God who loved you with an everlasting and infinite affection. I've often turn that over, that thought over in my mind, but I've never been able to express it as I have wished. If I were told that all the sons of men cared for me, that would be only as a drop in a bucket compared with Jehovah himself regarding me. If it were said that all the princes of the earth had fallen at some poor man's feet and laid aside their dignities so that they might relieve his deeds, it would be counted condescending kindness. But such an act would not be worthy to be spoken of in comparison with the infinite condescension and unparalleled love which brought the Savior from the skies to rescue and redeem such worthless rebels as we are. It is not possible that all the condescension of all the kind and compassionate men who have ever lived should be more than a small grain that could not tip the scale compared with the everlasting hills of the Savior's wondrous love. Now when you quote John 3.16, For God so loved the world, this is just a fuller expression of trying as feeble men do to express really what that love means in the mind of the Almighty. Why did He endure all things? And Paul even said, I endure all things for the elect's sake, for the church. Because he loved us. Can I have some of that love in me for lost mankind? Can I yield my body a living sacrifice? Which Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2 is my reasonable service. So he endured that we could have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And when you sing those songs in worship to the Almighty and to Jesus, when you sing those songs like, O oh, love that will not let me go, just go back to Calvary. And as another song says, lead me to Calvary. So there's the first thing I want us to emphasize that comes out of Matthew 27, 45 through 50 when we consider the ninth hour the hour in which our Lord died, He endured to the end. The next thing that we want to look at that comes from this is darkness. Darkness. Matthew 27, 45 reads, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. Don't know what that'd be like. I've been in a full eclipse one time that I can remember in my life. Well, there's nothing in the scriptures that says that the sun was eclipsing. But it was dark. And well, it might be dark. 
and well that earthquake should take place at his death when the mighty maker of it all died. There was not only a literal darkness, but a symbolic darkness in the death of Jesus Christ my Lord. In Luke 22, 53, Jesus said to his judges, But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Satan is of the power of darkness because he's a lie. He began a lie, the father of lies. He's a murderer from the beginning. All lies issue from him. A lie is contradictory to the truth. The truth is God's infallible word. Jesus said, if you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If you read the apostle of love, John, you'll see him talking about light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. 1 John, as I say, 1, 7. Jesus overcame darkness. You cannot mix light with darkness and come up with something else because light every time dispels darkness. Jesus overcame the darkness so that we would not ultimately, finally, and eternally be in it, in the devil's hell. Remember, there's outer darkness in that lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And somebody says, well, the scripture contradicted itself. How can there be a fire in a lake of fire and brimstone and there be outer darkness? I've never understood that kind of mind because he who can say, and with the power just in his words, let there be light. And out of nothing came light then he can make a place for all those who do not love him and who choose to walk in darkness and follow a lie that is eternal darkness, separated from all that is true, all that's holy, and all that's good, and even the originator, God himself, be separated with him from him forevermore. After all, if he can create a heaven as the Bible describes it, and says that you can be there with me through my will, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life, then he can make a place for those who choose on this earth to reject him, to live on their own level, to do their own thing, to be in subjection to nothing. You see, when people are told, depart from me, I never knew you, and to everlasting fire is prepared for the devil and his angels, he's simply saying, you chose to go there, and here it is. How did they choose to go there? Because it is they pleased. They were never involved in trying to submit to all the teachings of Christ. That did not concern them. They chose to walk in darkness. You don't have but one of two choices. Obey the truth and live in it, or reject it and live in darkness. And as far as people just trying to look at outer darkness and lake burning with fire and brimstone, well, I suggest to you, if you can understand on this earth that there can be a mighty hot place and very dark when you think of an oven, then you ought to be able to understand that God knows how to do that when it comes to meeting out the punishment men ask for in their rebellion to God on this earth and in their walking in darkness. But Jesus died, so we wouldn't have to do that. I don't know the way that I'm to go to heaven. There is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Jesus knows how to get me from earth to heaven. And there's just one way. As the song goes, to the pearly gates, to the crown of life, and it's called the old cross road. And that idea is anchored in the very thing we read a while ago, that in the ninth hour, Jesus yielded up the ghost. Because he said, it's finished. I've done all that deity can do to save a man, to make forgiveness of sins possible. It's all over and done with. I've done my part. Remember, his, his attitude was, when he came to this world, that I must die. I must be tempted in every point like his man is, and yet never sin. And that I must die to pay the price of men's sins. That they through faith in him and obedience to his gospel, the power of God to save, Romans 1.16, 
can someday be in heaven in a glorified state, even as Christ is at this very moment. Colossians 1.13, we're taught by Paul concerning our position in the church who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. And that's done by hearing, believing, and obeying the gospel. But then he said, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And we learned this morning from Colossians 1.18 that the body is the church and the church is the kingdom. So we see that he has delivered us from darkness, but darkness was there on that day while he was nailed to that cross and hanging there in agony, misery, and pain. And why? The only way to save you and me from our sins and everybody else, for he died for all men. The last point coming from this study of the ninth hour is death. In Matthew 27 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. He had said always, no man takes my life from me, I lay it down. When Jesus in his mind knew he had suffered to the uttermost, he had satisfied God's justice, then he willed himself to die. It is finished. Watch it. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he died. Now why did Jesus have to die? Well I hope we're getting the picture already. In Hebrews 2.9 the Hebrews writer to strengthen Jewish Christians from apostatizing said but we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. When we assemble for worship on the first day of the week as God's children, we come to that time that specifically shows forth the death of Christ to come again in the Lord's Supper. And we partake of it. And notice it's showing forth his death till he come again. It's talking about what happened in that ninth hour when Jesus yielded up the ghost, for he had suffered to the uttermost and accomplished his task. It is finished. Maybe such words as this will help us meditate better when we're thanking God for the bread that represents his body that knew no sin. And when we're partaking of the fruit of the vine, which he himself instituted this and gave the emblems as to what they're emblematic of, of the fruit of the vine representing the blood he shed on Calvary's cross. Maybe when we sing these songs about Jesus and the love of Jesus and the praise of God Almighty, that we'll think about the ninth hour. He died so that we could live. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. As I said some weeks ago, I've sat by the beds of many people who are breathing their last. Don't know how many. But I suppose the one that crosses my mind the most is as my father was dying. And all the signs came they told us to look for that meant death was imminent. I took him by the hand and said, Daddy, you just reach your hand up to the one you've served all your life. Let go of this old world. It's time to go. Now, I want that to be for all of us. I certainly want it for me and mine. And why shouldn't we rejoice in these exceeding great and precious promises? For Jesus died that ninth hour to make it possible. And Paul tells the Thessalonians, comfort one another with these words. Don't sorrow as those who have no hope. 
Let words like this drive us to endure ourselves and to fight the darkness in the form of evil and to bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ. For look what he did for us that we can't begin to fathom. And so with those who are Christians and they die, it's only but a short time that we're kept apart. And when we see one another again, it'll be with eyes not human, but made for an eternity. And there will be comfort beyond measure. The ninth hour is the hour that Jesus endured the pain, outlasted the darkness, and overcame death. Now the question I ask you as I close the lesson, what hour is it for you? It could be that you're in a time of pain and suffering. It comes on us all at one time or another, and to one extent or the other. Maybe much worse at times than others. Maybe you've been affected by the darkness and wickedness of this world because certainly it's all around us and it impacts us quite often. Perhaps you've been recently touched by death or a loved one suffering greatly. It's bore down heavily upon your shoulders. Well, remember that ninth hour for Christ took care of it all. And then there'll be the time coming when you must have your ninth hour. For it's appointed unto men once to die. And after this, the judgment. Now I suggest to you, if there's any consciousness about you at the time of your death, that if you can think clearly at all, you'll rejoice to remember the truths of God's Word that kept you all these years. And the mercy and the grace of God Almighty and Jesus Christ you have partaken of. And you've been steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So Jesus' message in the ninth hour is that you don't have to endure the pain alone. Jesus has done that. That you need not give in to the darkness for Jesus has dispelled the darkness that there is hope for life after death not a wish but a reality what the Bible says lies beyond this life in eternity with God there's much to get out of some little things such as the ninth hour in Jesus is dying and we ought to try to milk the scriptures for everything they're worth to get out of it all we can to help us be faithful to God until the end. Some of us will probably have to endure various kinds of diseases that may linger on. Others of us may be sick for a short time and then it's over. Some of us may not get home this afternoon, but it'll be very quick. But Jesus has paved the way. And look who lies just beyond just beyond the rolling river. And there's a song like that too, Gary. <laughs> there's no reason to not cross the Jordan without Christ. And there's a song that says you don't have to cross Jordan alone. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, in the light of Jesus in the ninth hour, of what he's done for you, we can never do for ourselves. Plead with you to determine all your life. You'll fear God to keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Trusting in Christ and his gospel, the power to save you. If as a child of God, you let things slip because you haven't let these things stay with you as they ought. You've given into the world in some way. We urge you to humbly repent of your sins, come confessing them, and pray God for forgiveness. Let all of us rise up as one and journey to the eternal day.